welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, one that was requested through a Twitter survey to refute a pair of episodes produced by the angry astronaut in which he tried to counter some of the claims we had made in our recent in-situ videos. One of the funniest claims Angry makes in these videos is right off the bat, claiming that we make shit up for the clicks and the subs. This would be what psychologists refer to as projection. While we do love the fact that people enjoy the content we provide for them, this two-part video was the first release we had done in over a month. It just seems that if we were doing this for the clicks, we'd be putting out daily content and really not giving any serious thought as to the quality of the videos. After watching all the mistakes he made in the first episode he released, we challenged to debate Angry about these points that he was bringing up in error. And at the end of his second episode, he declared this. He wanted to challenge me a debate long ago. I didn't want to give him the subscribers that, you know, that would doubtlessly generate if we did it. But his channel's been growing like crazy with people buying into this crap. So you know what? You want to debate CSS? Bring it. Then afterwards, on Twitter, he posted this tweet, knowing full well that he's blocked us from seeing his posts. And when we arranged for a debate moderator who follows both channels to play along, Angry ghosted him. So we're going to give you the episode you asked for. This is not the first time Angry has made the mistake of making a reaction video, so even the video title is misleading. The first time he did this against our channel was December of 2020, when he released his Starship Has an Enemy video. For the sake of getting those sweet views. His channel at the time was sitting at around 40,000 viewers. We were sitting at around 1,800 subscribers as a channel only six months old with under 100,000 views, and yet we still managed to get under his skin. Since then, his channel has doubled in size to about 87,000 subscribers, and ours has grown 40-fold in the same time frame to about 73,000. So it appears our rapid growth is actually making him really nervous. During his opening comments of his first video, Angry makes believe that we were making him a hobby of ours. And some time ago, I issued a video criticizing the work of one particular Elon hater out there. He then made me his hobby for a while, making a number of videos about me. Every man needs a hobby. I guess I was his. Maybe that makes him feel better after the proper spanking we gave him when we responded to his first video, where he was forced to concede our points about Starship being unable to hold 100 people based on the NASA stats indicating at best they're looking at 17 people inhabiting that volume, when we dissected his flawed comparison between Starship and HMS Victory volume per traveler, where he complained about the weight per meal we used in our calculations despite that number coming straight from NASA, the weight per person we used in calculations despite that number coming straight from the FAA as their average, claiming that the Epstein-Barr virus is not a problem for astronauts despite simple online searches that prove the opposite is true and that the virus affects the majority of astronauts. He displayed his inability to grasp our Bread on Mars episode examples, or even why we would use such a simple universal food such as bread for that episode. He went on to promote aquaponics on Mars without understanding why fish, specifically tilapia, are never going to make that trip, and we showed him why in the response. His level of chemistry understanding was made apparent when he told his viewers that fish make nitrogen for fertilizer completely unaware that nitrogen is a chemical element and that the only chemical elements that can be excreted by an animal are the same ones they ingest in the first place. Nothing is making new nitrogen atoms from thin air or fish poop. He repeated Musk's belief that radiation on a Mars excursion would not cause any issues at all, despite the fact that NASA considers radiation to be one of the greatest threats to such a mission. There's certainly some risk of radiation, um, but it's not... It's not um... It's not deadly. And we wrapped up that video with a prediction that seems to have come true. That pretty much wraps up the list of claims Angry tried taking on from our videos. But it seems he's one of these fire-ready aim producers that's in this for the money. So he'll probably take another swing at us when he needs some cash. And that's where we left Angry behind. Until he released a video around the middle of 2021 that tackled Jeff Bezos' claim that living at the top of Everest would be a tropical paradise compared to living on Mars. Our viewers made sure we saw that one, and they wanted our take on it. In that video, Angry makes several claims that needed to be straightened out. So by request, we made an episode exposing the technologies that Angry was sure was going to make life on Mars livable. First, it was the Martian Habitat, a 3D printed cylinder produced by AI Space Factory that won a NASA design competition without following the rules, 
which stated that whatever demonstration they provided was made completely using materials found readily on Mars, another in situ application as it were. As we explained in our video, Martia not only requires an organic type of plastic which cannot be found on Mars, that material is meant to be combined with basalt, and there are precious few basalt outcroppings on Mars. Most of them are in the area of Olympus Mons. During our investigation, we also discovered that AI Space Factory was involved in a failed Indiegogo project that was promoting patrons vacations in similar structures on Earth that did not, and still do not, exist. The company is now dodging demands for refunds on Indiegogo, trying instead to keep the money they raised by offering their donors NFTs in exchange for the vacations that people thought they were buying. Then he did a segment about the biosuit, proposed by David Newman at MIT, which Angry got mad at NASA for for not financing them and called them a bunch of idiots. It still requires a little bit more research, a little bit more investment from NASA, which of course they haven't given to MIT because they're idiots. Oh, okay. Not realizing that the suit had been in development for 21 years since at least the year 2000, and NASA had indeed provided a great deal of money to the project until 2005 for which they received a bodysuit that was little more than biker's armor stitched together by Italian manufacturer Dionese. So angry calling NASA idiots for not financing the project further was completely out of line. In two decades, Newman failed to deliver even the most basic criteria of the suit itself, and never even started working on the life support pack for use with that suit. A shame really, because every lady astronaut should look this good when she's abandoned in a toxic barren wasteland. Angry was also under the impression that while on Mars, astronauts would be able to lounge around, enjoy blue sunsets, and take day trips in balloons to Olympus Mons or the Valles Marineris, not realizing that the surface of Mars is roughly the same area as the landmass on Earth, and that the sites he was listing off are separated by thousands of kilometers from each other. And finally, in the closing comments of that video, Angry told his audience that kids born on Mars would be able to traipse throughout the solar system. Seriously, here's what he said. But then they have the rest of the solar system to pick from because all the rest of the moons of the gas giants, none of them have the same gravity problems that Earth does. So there's a lot of adventure for Martian children in the future. Needless to say, we showed him why that was not going to happen either. So when Angry says he's tried really hard not to mention us for the past year or so, these would be the reasons why. It has never ended well for him and this time is going to be no different. So let's get started with the most recent errors, just in his opening comments of his most recent, not the first, reaction video that Angry has made against a Common Sense Skeptic episode. Angry starts off the first episode by waxing poetic about how colonizing Mars will be one of the greatest undertakings humankind can embark on. Then he goes on to say this. One of the most annoying hurdles that we're going to have to clear at some point is all the damn naysayers who say that this stuff is impossible, especially those who are using either completely false or misleading science to back their arguments. Just to address labeling any presentation of science as completely false or misleading, there is no such thing. Science doesn't care what we think. It doesn't care what Angry thinks. It just is. But this next bit explains why Angry felt the need to publish this pair of videos. His channel has been growing very well. He's been doing an excellent job coming after Elon, which I don't have a problem with as long as your science is sound. And he should have stopped there, but he went on to say, And in this case, it just isn't. And that's how he closed his opening monologue, challenging the validity of the science we used in an episode where the numbers we used came from the periodic table, the ideal gas law, and NASA before he plugged them into online calculators anybody can find to show where the results come from and how you can play with the numbers however you like. So we're going to take clips of this video where Angry makes his statements and either explain where our information came from, why the information was relevant, or how Angry really was not able to follow along. He kind of sums it all up with this statement. I'm not sure how much of this is intended to be used for educational purposes and how much of it is just trying to demonstrate how smart and educated this guy is and so therefore to make the case that he is indeed right. So a couple of things to unpack here. To begin with, if you think these episodes are produced to demonstrate our high levels of intelligence or education, you have completely missed the point of our channel. Like, totally missed the mark. Missed it by that much. 
we don't hand out personal information, including our level of education or field of study, because our goal is to help everybody understand that they are perfectly capable of coming to these same conclusions by themselves. Simply by remembering, in this case, what they learned in high school organic chemistry classes, the laydown of science electives. If you graduated high school, you very likely took this stuff. You just haven't used it for a while. Even if you only remember the most basic concepts from those classes, you have a starting point to work from. And since we give you the numbers and where they came from, you can break out a calculator, if you want to, to check any of it yourself. The point that he's trying to make here is that the whole concept of using ISRU to create methane uh, and to make create methyl ox rather on Mars is laughably impossible. I believe I quoted him directly there. Two things to take away from this. Respectable rocket engineers do not use the term methyl ox. It's a term that people such as everyday astronaut use to sound smart, but it's not an accepted industry term. The other is that Angry is misquoting us by saying we said the in situ example we use is impossible. Here's the transcript from that episode. The word impossible does not appear a single time in the search result. What we said was, trying to do it the way Musk is describing is laughably, scientifically fictitious. As in the type of MacGuffin technology you only see in science fiction movies. By the way, NASA is also trying to do this as well. They also plan to do this. So apparently what they're trying to do is also laughably impossible. NASA is trying to figure out how to use native materials on Mars. Absolutely. And MOXIE is the first device they've sent to Mars to attempt in situ creation of oxygen, as we showed. Their plans, however, do not include trying to use those resources to relaunch a giant 50 meter cigar tube from Mars, which can only possibly end in disaster when they launch it from loose regolith. NASA's operating mandate for a manned expedition to Mars is a completely different paradigm, involving only four to six crew after testing those systems and habitats, etc., on the moon, where rescue is only days away. Until they can nail things down on the moon, NASA's not going to Mars. But even if NASA was considering making this amount of methane on Mars for this purpose, the numbers we present in the episode don't change because it's NASA. Resources are what they are. Solar irradiance is 60%. Carbon dioxide is 95% of the atmosphere. Laws of energy and mass conservation exist for a reason. Any solutions being proposed have to operate under that framework, which is exactly what we used throughout the episode. Really, there's a whole lot of style and not a lot of substance in that first 25 minutes. A lot of chemical formulas, a lot of in-depth description. Way to contradict yourself, bud. A whole lot of style and not a lot of substance would be the polar opposite of a lot of in-depth description. But here we go with Angry's dissertation on our first of two parts, trying his very best to describe a process that he cannot pronounce properly. A very in-depth description of the process of converting carbon and oxygen um, and hydrogen, all of those into uh, into methane with the Sabatier process. Sabatier, some people have told me is pronounced, I've, I've heard it pronounced all kinds of ways. No, you haven't heard this pronounced a bunch of different ways. There's one way to properly pronounce that name. Sabatier. Sabatier. The name Sabatier. If you've heard it pronounced differently somewhere else, they were wrong too. And if you can't be bothered to look up the proper pronunciation of the process, what are the odds you have a grasp on the topic? That being said, Angry did manage to get one thing right here. The process we described in our video is what Musk has stated needs to happen. In any event, this is what Elon says is going to be necessary in order to be able to create methane on Mars. Of course, he says that the uh, Sabatier process is not properly described by Elon, that there is actually um, other uh, steps to the process, which is actually true. However, this is something that's already been identified. Um, the University of California is already working on a process to make methane, uh, make the, uh, the, pro the Sabatier process follow are more efficient and not requiring as many steps as this guy's talking about. It's wonderful that the University of California is working on ways to make the Sabache reaction more efficient. But are they going to beat 100% efficiency? Because that's just one padding of the numbers that we worked into our calculations, something we normally do by the way. Not take into account inefficiencies in a system to make the numbers as conservative as possible. In this 2021 overview of the reaction on ScienceDirect.com, 
energetic efficiency of the methanization process is described as having 70% efficiency. When combined with the 50% efficiency of the electrolysis process, that gives the total system being described only a 35% overall efficiency rating. Best of luck to the University of California in their efforts to counter the 65% loss of energy in a Savace reaction. And once they perfect it, they'll match the 100% number that we already used. Angry's next gripe is about our choice of solar panels. So he takes uh, some of the Tesla solar panels as an example of what we're going to use on Mars. He knows damn well that we're not going to be using technology that primitive. We'll be using far more efficient solar panels than what is used by SpaceX at the moment. The solar arrays that were deployed on the ISS recently are way more efficient than that. So that's another problem. Again, are those solar panels installed on the ISS operating at peak output all day? Because that's the number we attributed to the solar panels in our example. Another padding because the bell curve of the solar production over the course of the day was completely ignored. We used the peak value of those panels as if the panel generated that output every minute the sun shines on them at the equator. We also ignored the seasonality of solar energy on Mars, which is another bell curve. Earth has the same thing because tilts of both planets are similar. Seasonally, output drops again, but we ignored that fact. Around here, in cowboy terms, this method of padding the numbers is called giving them rope. When critics such as Angry weigh in on topics without fully understanding them, they can't identify we've padded the numbers until they are beyond reproach. Someone familiar with the topic understands the pads that we build in and knows such an argument is useless. Here are some other ways that we padded energy numbers and production requirements, some of which were mentioned, some of them weren't. We didn't add in, for example, the energy consumed by the heavy equipment to drill for and haul water, or the equipment required to recharge those vehicles. The energy required for water pumps, the amount of energy required to compress and chill the gases, the heat management system required for the equipment being used, because air cooled is not going to be a thing on Mars, the amount of energy required to thermally manage the gases or the cryoliquids, the energy the colonists would use while working for things such as heating and pressurization of workspaces and life support. Energy required to conduct maintenance on those systems or downtimes. And we also gave them 500 days to create their stores of cryogenic propellants when it would likely take many months to set up the equipment and production plant, which is something else that Angry didn't agree with. All of his mathematics is based around the idea that humans are only going to have 18 months to manufacture the necessary methane. And this, of course, is completely flawed from the get-go. This is absolutely true. And we said it in the video. This is for 500 days on the surface and the quotas that would have to be filled daily. We showed where NASA gave those timelines, and since Musk expects to run these ships back and forth between the planets, as he has stated many times before, that seemed to give the colonists a better window than the shorter Russian plan we pointed out. Point being, we did not pick an arbitrary number. And then, Angry headed off into fantasy land. Anybody who's going to send a mission to Mars is going to send automated factories and drilling machines, etc., processors, in order to manufacture the methane long before the astronauts even arrive. There's no sort of dramatic race that astronauts are going to have to be engaged in to create the methane in time. You can do all of this ahead of time, and I, I would assume this guy knows this. He just doesn't tell you. Angry hangs a lot of hopes on these magical robots that will show up on Mars ahead of time and get everything set up for Musk's Martians. So where are they? Who's developing them? Where are these amazing robots that can do all these things on another planet? You know, build fuel plants, mine and haul water, build their own solar farms, troubleshoot methane production plants. You know, the proof of concept, instead of just a CGI video of Lego blocks with wheels zipping around on the regolith or videos of clunky prototypes playing in the sand on Earth under Earth-like conditions. If there's people in the room with it, it is not Mars temperature, not Mars pressure, and certainly not Mars gravity conditions. So where are those machines being tested? Closest thing we have on Mars right now to these experimental machines are the rovers. They're about the size of an SUV. On flat, stable ground, maximum operating speed of Perseverance is less than 0.1 miles or 0.16 kilometers per hour. So it's not covering a lot of ground. And all this is true, by the way, but this is a problem with the overall plan, not a problem with Elon himself. No, no, no. If it's a problem with the overall plan, and that's the paradigm Musk continues to operate under, then it is a problem with Musk because he is not presenting a viable concept. And yet he's making all these promises to his fanboys 
while knowing the underlying paradigm has no chance of success. Also talks about silly industrial uh, blowers, industrial machines that somebody would buy at Home Depot as maybe a, you know, something that you would use to extract the necessary CO2. I don't even know why he discusses that. Angry can't understand why we would include extraction fans like this. And the answer is simple. Most of you have seen or used one of these before. You know how powerful they are, how much air they can move, and you probably stood in front of one. It's a familiar piece of equipment, and the larger goal here was to show what kind of power such a fan would consume. We could bring up images of gear you've never seen or heard of before, but that's an obscure reference that would go over most people's heads. Keeping it familiar keeps people connected to the material being presented, after which we showed the scroll compressor unit being used on Mars in Moxie, which Angry apparently didn't see, taking us into his critique of our second episode. So let's go ahead and uh, find out what the common sense skeptic is going to teach us about making methane on Mars. As he's running through these clips, he occasionally remembers he's making a video and he shows how little thought he's put into this whole thing. For example, when we mention that colonists will somehow have to store volumes of CO2 for processing, he just shrugs it off. Somehow store. I mean, we store liquid gases all the time. Yes, we do collect and store gases and cryoliquid all the time. But this is an example of the system components required to do this on Earth, just to bottle air. From here, there's a bunch of long stretches where Angry forgets he's on camera, so we're going to skip over those bits until he pipes up and says something, such as this. I don't even know why the hell we're talking about this. Why does the volume of carbon dioxide on Mars even matter to this discussion? Yeah, what possible reason would talking about the volumes of collected gases getting prepped for a production process in a near vacuum serve? Complete mystery, that. No sh Sherlock. Of course you would need that. See, if it goes without saying, then it needs to be said, because leaving that part out would be presenting incomplete information. A puzzle without all the pieces, as it were. Sometimes you actually have to state the obvious. Obviously. On Mars, Scientists think there's about 5 billion cubic kilometers... Okay, hold on. Now, this is something, once again, he loves to do these kinds of graphics to demonstrate just a look. Oh, look at that tiny bit of water that's on Mars. Oh, my God, there's hardly anything there. 5 million cubic kilometers. Yes, we do like these kinds of graphics, and we spend quite a bit of time making sure they're accurate and present the information fairly. For example, if we really wanted to bias this graphic, we could have presented the spheres as disks with a depth of one kilometer, make it area instead of volume. And that would have made the graphic look like this. But what we used visually demonstrates the differences between the planets nicely, as opposed to running the same unrelated video clip over and over again as Angry does, or bringing up nonsense like this, which has nothing to do with the amount of water on the planet. Massive naval battles and, you know, huge expeditions of exploration in the past. I mean, the amount of water we have on Earth is utterly insane. And there is no liquid water on Mars. Bullsh**! There absolutely could be liquid water on Mars. Calling bullshit on this really lets us know where his depth of knowledge sits, and it's definitely at the shallow end of the pool. For water to exist in liquid form anywhere, the pressure and temperature of the environment have to be balanced. If the temperature goes too high or if the pressure goes too low, then it evaporates or sublimates from ice directly to vapor. On Mars, it's the lack of atmospheric pressure that causes it to boil off at very low temperatures. This is a phase chart for water. You can see how temperature and pressure act against the three states of water. Moreover, you can see that at Martian atmospheric density, there's a triple point for water. This is straight from our episode. To take Martian conditions and ensure you can keep melted ice in liquid form, it has to be heated and pressurized. No getting around it. Liquid water on the surface evaporates, ice on the surface sublimates, and electrolysis requires liquid water. These are the facts. There are so many other types of elements, including perchlorates and other things that, you know, we've talked about that, you know, create problems with water, but subsurface, it has not only been theorized, many people really believe that because of the different elements that are also present in Martian water, it changes the freezing point dramatically. And the argument here is that because water ice below the surface is likely contaminated with perchlorate salt, that the salt will drastically reduce the freezing point of water. An example of this on Earth would be the difference in temperature between freezing points of fresh water and oceanic salt water. Fresh water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius. Ocean water freezes at minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. Not a drastic difference. 
But what about brine, which is probably what Angry is referring to. Not liquid water, but a heavily saturated solution with up to 26% solute. Evidence of brines have been found on Mars, when they melted the ice that it formed and found this high concentration of salt. The lowest freezing point of brines eutectic on Earth is minus 21.1 degrees Celsius, so a difference of 21 degrees from the normal freezing point of water. And as we've been saying all along, the average temperature on Mars is minus 60 C, so still not holding our collective breath for liquid puddles of anything sitting on or near the surface or within the permafrost layer of the crust. But this brings up Angry's perchlorate statement. True, distilling the water is going to require some of this. But also, as I've mentioned in a number of my videos, there are many types of earthborn bacteria. Those bacteria break it down and destroy and, and eliminate the perchlorates. They can also um, produce oxygen for our use, and that requires no energy whatsoever. Angry believes earthborn bacteria will be brought along and used to reduce perchlorates and produce oxygen while purifying the water needed for electrolysis. He also thinks this process will require no energy whatsoever. But as they say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Sure, earthborn bacteria can reduce perchlorates. Turns out they love eating these compounds that are quite toxic to us. But these are earthborn organisms. Even microbial life has yet to be found on Mars. So these bacteria imported from Earth would need to be contained in a sealed system, then provided with ideal conditions for temperature and pressure. That's on top of the equipment needed for their bioreactor. As you can see from this example of a wastewater purification system, they would use quite a bit of energy, just for the stirring pumps. Collecting the gases would require fans and compressors, separators, and condensers for the oxygen and for the chloride being produced. Depending on the volume of production required, that could be a very large facility, so that's another dedicated system that needs to be brought from Earth and built on Mars. Obviously saying it will require no energy whatsoever is completely inaccurate. Now this has nothing to do with our episode at all, since we were using processes described and promoted by Musk for use on Mars. But it shows how little thought is going into the material that Angry presents to his viewers, and again during this reaction video. Why do we need the basic chemistry lesson? If you really have to ask why we're providing the equivalent of a basic chemistry lesson while discussing a basic chemical process, you probably need this information more than anyone else watching. And your next statement perfectly explains the differences between our two channels. It's almost he's like in a class, he has to show his proof here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the professor exactly how I came to these figures. Yes, Angry, we show our work. We think it's important for people to know where the numbers come from and how they're being used. That way, if they want to work out different scenarios, we have already reminded them how to do that. It's a technique we've yet to see you use. Again, once again, every day they're going to have to do this. Well, that's if they have only 18 months at their disposal, if they're stupid enough to only start the process when they arrive. Any logical and intelligent mission is going to do all of this stuff beforehand with robots before we even risk human beings. If the definition of a logical, intelligent mission to Mars includes sending robots before humans so as not to endanger human lives unnecessarily, then we can all agree that Musk is not promoting a logical, intelligent mission. Not only do his Mars colonization fantasies not involve robots, he has already told anybody thinking about going, there is a good chance they're going to die. So why would anybody, including you, defend Musk and these fantasies? It's actually useful information right there. It's nice to know those details. According to another online calculator at OptiCalculator.com, just to warm the ice up from minus 60 Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, where the hell did you get that figure from? Why is the ice going to be minus 60 degrees Celsius? So glad you asked. It came from this NASA graphic we used in our videos, depicting the range of temperatures and the average temperature of both Earth and Mars. It's not something we made up, not a number out of thin air, and it shows the temperatures on Mars bottom out at around minus 140 C. Knowing this information makes your next rant even more entertaining to watch. There are many places on the surface of Mars where the temperature is much, 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 much warmer than minus 60 degrees Celsius. So, I mean, obviously, ice tends to be zero degrees Celsius, the freezing point of water. Angry thinks that ice tends to be zero degrees Celsius, but that's not true. Ice takes on the temperature of its environment and can be frozen down towards absolute zero. However, according to the graphic, minus 63 is a planet-wide average, 
So let's go to one of your favorite spots that you've mentioned a couple of times. Let's go to Valles Marineris and see how warm it is there, which is, according to you, right on the equator. Valles Marineris is a monstrous gash across the face of Mars, whose depth makes the Grand Canyon look like a mud puddle. Being sunk below the plains above it at depths of up to 7 kilometers could greatly reduce the amount of sunlight it experiences on a daily basis. And, as it turns out, Angry is right. The temperature wouldn't be minus 60 degrees Celsius. Average temperature is minus 73 degrees Celsius, according to this article. But here's another fun fact. If you were standing on the Martian equator at noon, it would feel like summer at your feet, but winter near your head. At night, it's even worse. When the sun goes down, temperatures can plummet to negative triple digits. And beware of cold winter nights when it could drop even lower. So if you plan to visit, better bring a spacesuit to keep warm. Mars really is a pretty cool planet. Just because the surface is warming up doesn't mean the atmosphere is. And in some places, actually, it gets much warmer than that on Mars. It get to the point where water would actually melt if it were on the surface. The reason, of course, there is no surface water is because of atmospheric pressure, not always because of temperature. Sorry, what was that you just said? Of course, there is no surface water. Was that you saying there's no liquid water on Mars? Didn't you have an opinion on that earlier when we said the exact same thing? Bullshit. There absolutely could be liquid water on Mars. Yeah, thought that's what you said. And once again, to continue making this more and more impossible, we're gonna have to, you know, get stuff from the poles where it's minus 60 degrees Celsius and then warm it up and then truck it to, uh, to our landing site. You know what's even funnier than condescending fake voices? Pointing out that the person making them got all their information wrong including thinking the temperature at the poles of Mars is only minus 60 C, when it's more like minus 125 in the winter. Our videos never stated that they would have to truck polarized to the equator where the landers are. That would be stupid. The distance between the equator and either pole is about 5,300 kilometers, so it would take a machine like Perseverance almost four years driving day and night without brakes to make that trip if the ground was flat and packed hard the entire way. No, what we said was, there are seasonal pockets of surface ice on Mars, but those locations are generally at the poles of the planet, which would be the exact wrong landing site if you're powering your equipment with solar power. Since the visible surface ice is located at the poles and the colony would likely not be, they could wind up having to dig down in the hopes of hitting a pocket of solid ice. You can either land where there is seasonal exposed water ice at the poles to make water collection easier, or you can land at the equator to get your best performance from the solar arrays that you're using. You can't have it both ways. Moving into his next series of statements. Elon went to NASA to ask where large reservoirs of water ice just beneath the surface are probably located in order to pick some landing sites and these are the locations that NASA gave him and it's nowhere near the poles so the whole notion that you're going to have to truck water ice all the way from the poles is completely incorrect it's completely I, I just, I can't even believe he's saying this. And once again, it seems to me that he's just trying to take advantage of uninformed people. And once again, not cool, dude. I mean, you can criticize Elon, just get your science a little better. By all means, please continue. 2001 Mars Odyssey Gamma Ray Spectrometer. This stuff is over two decades out of date. And this is what he's showing us. This see, no water on Mars. You want to see another map? How about this one? Look at all that water ice that's located in the Valles Marineris right on the damn equator. Okay, our turn. Let's deal with some of your claims and the maps you presented. Here's a couple of points for consideration. If that map is accurate and portraying abundant water in the Kandor Chasma, why isn't NASA planning on landing there? This is the topographical map you used depicting what you said were the landing sites suggested to Musk from NASA for future consideration. And by running a comparison of this map against Google Mars, this shows those sites are nowhere near the Candor Chasma or the Valles Marineris where Isa Exo indicated the water was. Candor Chasma is depicted as 4,000 kilometers east-southeast of Olympus Mons, give or take. The topography map that you provided indicates that most of those NASA-suggested sites are located in the low-lying flat plains of Arcadia Planitia, around Erebus Montes, 2,900 kilometers west-northwest of Olympus Mons. So the question would be, why would NASA be telling Musk to land 7,100 kilometers away from this identified resource? 
Also, your entire point shrivels and dies as soon as we concede that it may be possible to find subsurface pockets of ice in the equatorial region, which was our very next point. I mean, kind of nice to know this, I suppose. Oh yeah, uh, these are the solar panels we're going to be using, so that's how much space we're going to need. We're never going to make more efficient solar panels. Yep, we actually took the time to demonstrate what the array of solar panels would look like compared to a football field. If they didn't need to charge batteries to run the equipment day and night, if we ignore the bell curve of solar production over the course of the day, if we ignored the seasonal production bell curve over the course of the year, and if all the panels were kept perfectly clean from electrostatically charged pulverized regolith dust. What we showed here was a drastic underestimation. Again, here we go. Minus 60 degrees Celsius. I mean, he's pumping up the numbers as much as possible in order to maximize the amount of energy that's going to be necessary to make this happen. So here's the deal with this claim. He's under the impression that the numbers we're using are jacked up in a biased fashion by setting the temperature at minus 60 C, the average temperature on Mars. He is apparently unaware of the effect temperatures have on a gas, so we're going to help him out. At minus 60 C, the number we used, 66.22 kilomoles of hydrogen gas took up 192,388 cubic meters. At minus 30 C, that same amount of hydrogen now occupies 219,466 cubic meters and at zero degrees Celsius, it balloons to 246,544 cubic meters. So the accusation he's making here is exactly backwards when talking about dealing with the volumes of gases since volume and temperature are on opposite sides of the ideal gas law equation. And after this, for over two minutes, he watches and says nothing and appears to forget he's on camera. Then after we laid everything out for him in black and white, what was his response? <laughs> Okay, once again, I don't trust this guy's math when it comes to what it's going to take um, for the for the process to convert all of this into into methane. I really don't. But what he did is use similar fuzzy math to come up with a figure that an exploding full stack of a starship would create an explosion the equivalent of four Hiroshima bombs. When you blow up, a, you know, a flammable substance, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't. It's not the same as a nuclear nuclear explosion and the sudden release of energy that comes from a nuclear reaction. Instead, it's a conflagration of mostly burning with maybe 15% or so of the mass being converted into an explosion. This is in reference to episode 7 that we did a long time ago that Angry can't remember properly, where we compared what actually happened with the N1 rocket and the damage caused by that explosion to a fully loaded starship and booster catastrophe. Our assessment was that the actual magnitude of the blast would be somewhere in the 14 kiloton range, and we quite specifically stated that was the blast radius. Of course, the radiation of a nuke is a completely different animal, but the blast, like any other blast, is measured in kilotons, meaning kilotons of the conventional explosive TNT. This is something that, no matter how many times it's explained to them, it never manages to sink in. This is how they measure blast force. Then he tells his viewers, Instead, it's a conflagration of mostly burning, which is nonsense, and it's the wrong word to use. A conflagration example would be a fast-moving wildfire moving through brush, like must causes to happen on the protected wildlife areas surrounding Boca Chica on a regular basis. The difference between a deflagration, what he means to say, and a detonation is whether or not the chemical reaction exceeds the sound barrier. Subsonic reactions are deflagrations. Anytime there's a shockwave associated with an explosive gas, that is the expansion of the gas breaking the sound barrier, which is the minimum threshold required to move that reaction from deflagration to detonation. If you hear a boom, that's an explosion. If the event hurls debris, that's an explosion. Take SN4 for example. After a test, so with relatively empty tanks, SN4 detonated sending a shockwave skyward that was visible to cameras across the bay. SN8 exploded when it hit the ground. SN9 exploded when it hit the ground. SN10 waited a while, then it exploded after it landed because there was a fire burning underneath it. And SN11 obviously exploded before it even hit the ground because materials were spread all over Hell's Half Acre and four protected nature preserves. Of course, not a lot has happened since then, but recently Booster 7 had an incident <laughs> And just that tiny explosive fart smacked the cameras and microphones of NASA spaceflight several miles away. 
If just that tiny anomaly can put out a blast wave like that, a fully loaded full-scale disaster is going to be a major catastrophic event. At this point, as we've said before, all we can do is wait to see what kind of widespread destruction that's going to cause when this thing explodes on the pad. That concern is shared strongly by NASA with regards to pad 39A. <sighs> I don't see how people sit through this. Well angry at over 35,000 views so far, it turns out more of our people have watched our episode than you had watched any of your last 24 episodes. Our guys have no problem sitting through a 25 minute video. Hell, that's the short one around here these days. So it would seem we've tuned into a completely different demographic than the one you have. Ours appreciate the breakdowns because they're very easy to share with the people who really need this information. All this would have to set up an array of solar panels measuring several acres in size, or bring an appropriate number of nuclear reactors to power a multi-stage processing plant. Or one Chinese one megawatt nuclear reactor. The Chinese might eventually have that level of technology, but that still doesn't help Musk. And since we demonstrated that NASA does not have that technology yet, since they're now just farming out the 40 kilowatt concepts for study at this point, even using those much smaller devices for calculations is jumping the gun. Extracting CO2 from the Martian atmosphere is not going to be an absolute necessity either. There are ways to break down carbon from the Martian regolith. We know there's a fair amount of carbon in the Martian regolith and there are pockets of it in greater concentrations. There are ways that you can create CO2 by cooking the regolith and extracting it that way. A reminder that this is not what Musk is proposing at all. He has very specifically stated that their plan is to use the atmosphere and the Sabatje process. But let's deal with this statement anyway. If you're not planning on using atmospheric gas and are instead mining minerals such as calcium carbonate or pockets of carbon dioxide ice, those are entirely different sets of logistics that need considering. And at the end of each day, you still have to come up with 1,483.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide daily to hit the quotas we set. As an aside, this 2016 map from NASA indicates where surface frozen CO2 forms frost most often. In order for CO2 to deposit from gas to solid, the temperature has to be below minus 78.5 degrees Celsius on Earth, which is about here on the carbon dioxide phase diagram. The temperature on Mars would be to the left of there, considering the near vacuum worth of atmospheric pressure on the surface. So remember when Angry was whining that minus 60 C was an unfair number to use? There's that. If you're mining CO2 ice, that's one set of challenges, including sealing the mining site to prevent the sublimation of the ice. If you're mining calcium carbonate, it's only going to present as a percentage of the material being mined, so you'll be moving far more material than the 1500 kilos you need to collect. Then you'll have to release the CO2 from the minerals by heating it up to 840 degrees Celsius to produce carbon dioxide and lime, which is another energy intensive procedure. Again, there's no free lunch on Mars. No matter how you collect the carbon dioxide, it is going to take energy. He's right though. It is to produce that much damn methane is going to be extremely challenging. Again, this is why there have been other proposals about a smaller mini starship, landing craft, whatever, that you would send to Mars. So here, Angry brings up the mini starship he featured in one of his old episodes. This is something SpaceX is not working on and has never mentioned, or if they have, we haven't seen it. In fact, what Musk has mentioned before is an even larger version of Starship, a 2.0, with numbers even more whacked out than they are now. No, when you're talking about this mini Starship, then you're talking Mars Direct 3.0, which is the Mars Society, which is Robert Zubrin. And anytime Mars is brought up, you'll see Zubrin trying to inject himself into the conversation as a self-proclaimed expert. Musk's plans to colonize Mars are based off Zubrin's original Mars Direct paradigm, that Zubrin was paid to co-author in 1990 for Martin Marietta, and at the core of that publication was in-situ fuel production on Mars. After Zubrin and Martin Marietta went their own ways, Zubrin still needed to put bread on the table, so he went into business for himself, pretending to be the go-to guy for Mars. You may have seen his cameos in the Nat Geo series called Mars, which was a pretty good science fiction show. But his credibility got shot to pieces after his involvement with the multi-million dollar scam called Mars One, for which he was a primary advisor. We did a pair of episodes called Debunking Off-World Dreams, which tore Mars One to shreds. Give them a look and you'll see why anybody who was promoting that fraud as a workable reality can no longer be taken seriously. 
Angry loves this guy, but around here we just consider him to be another whack job. And Mini Starship? Just another vaporware CGI that nobody's even working on. But the, the issue is, is that this guy does nothing but talk about the challenges. Well, not just the challenges, the impossibilities, the way he describes them without presenting any real solutions. I've never liked that. Don't give me a damn problem unless, you know, if there's a solution, which there is, by the way. Allow us to be perfectly clear about this notion of having to offer solutions to issues we identify with Musk's plans. We are under no obligation to fix his mistakes or compensate or make excuses for his stupidity. If we were to offer a solution here, it would be for SpaceX to fire Musk and abandon this ridiculous Mars colony delusion he's operating under and get back to work on bigger and better Falcon Dragon combinations. Starship and Cities on Mars are two pieces of venture capital raising vaporware used by Musk to sell private shares in the company to people with more money than brains. They're no different than the people wanting to throw away their money on his Twitter deal. But let's give this a more scientific perspective. Scientists use the peer review method to verify their experiment articles until any other team running the same procedure can come up with the same result. That's what makes it science, replicatable results. But when an experiment is published and people can't make the experiment work based on the information provided in the paper, or they can't make heads or tails out of the research, it is not up to the peer reviewers to fix the mistakes of the author. They can ask for clarification or additional analysis and experimentation but correcting the data is not part of this process. The Big Bang Theory had an episode that illustrated this perfectly. Season 7, Episode 10 is called The Discovery Dissipation. Sheldon believed he had discovered a new element, and he rushed to publish his findings, but there was an error in the calculations that became apparent when Leonard ran them and disproved Sheldon's work. That was Leonard's role, to prove or disprove the existence of the element based on what Sheldon published. It was not Leonard's role to fix it somehow and make this fictional element magically appear. Similarly, we take what Musk says and dissect those promises and statements until we can identify errors occurring at the most basic, indisputable levels. So in this example, we're the publisher rejecting Musk's claims on their face because they can't survive even minimal amounts of scrutiny. That is our role. Angry says he prefers to offer solutions. That's great. So let's review the solutions he's already offered to future Martians. The habitats they can't build, the suits they can't wear, the fish they can't bring, the perchlorate-eating bacteria he's heard about but doesn't understand what requirements they might have, the robots that don't exist to set everything up for them pre-arrival, and plan on getting your power from experimental Chinese nuclear reactors that are just now being developed, have no technical specs to review, and would never be sold to Musk regardless because it's nuclear technology. Instead of dealing with radiation, just ignore it, and instead of trying to understand the basic chemistry of our episodes, ignore that too. All fine and dandy to claim you're offering solutions, but are you really? Gave us a lot of formulas and gave us a lot of calculations and a lot of online calculators that you can use to come up with these figures. What he didn't give us is other scholarly articles that support his point of view. Do you know why he did that? Because they don't exist. Because no one is taking this negative of a view on in situ resource use utilization on Mars. So in case anyone is under the impression that all of the stages of collection, refinement, and storage that we went through are unnecessary, Marspedia disagrees. This is a diagram that would have made our lives a hell of a lot easier had we found it when we first started making the video, but we have it now, so let's share it. It breaks down the flowchart, equipment required, massive equipment, energy consumption, and pretty much everything else that we drew up from scratch, but it's for a vehicle on the surface of Mars with two years to produce the methane and oxygen required for a single ship, powered by solar panels. Our model used 500 days, they used 730. The process in this diagram collects 1,220 kilograms of Martian atmosphere daily, runs it through a compressor, then a water condenser, a CO2 condenser, and inserts 1,155 kilograms of CO2 per day into the storage tank. Then it moves into the Sabachi reactor to create 420 kilograms of methane per day after running it through three more condensers. On the other side, they collect 1,890 kilograms of water ice per day, add it to a water tank to warm it up by 80 degrees, run it through an electrolysis cycle, separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, then both gases head off to their respective storage tanks. 1,680 kilograms of oxygen gets parked in the tank, the hydrogen goes into the Sabachi reactor to help build the methane molecules. The numbers used in this diagram put us firmly in the ballpark. 
if anything we underestimated some of the collection totals. According to this chart, the total solar energy required per day comes to 13,000 kilowatt hours. That's 4,515 dedicated solar panels, again putting us in the right neighborhood. That translates to 27 nuclear reactors running 12 hour duty cycles, or 14 of them running around the clock. None of our numbers were out of whack compared to this model. And until robots can build this kind of system on Earth without supervision, using only components that can fit in a Starship cargo hold and come out their cargo hatch and down their cargo crane, there is absolutely no reason to believe that machines are going to be able to do this autonomously on Mars. So that is our model confirmed and Angry's rebuttal destroyed. The rest of this episode was just for fun. Thank you for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, and we would invite you to watch our other episodes where we've taken on Angry's rantings in their entirety so you can better understand the differences between our two channels. There's a reason why he's able to put out an episode nearly every day, and ours take a week or more to put together. It is the same reason why his channel and our channel are growing at completely different rates. One thing we are going to say before signing off is that, as skeptics, we hold people making fantastical claims to account. It is their responsibility to prove these claims, not ours. But we have taken it upon ourselves to shine light through as many holes in the claims being made as possible using simple investigation. If basic common sense is all it takes to see through the Silicon Valley and space billionaire smoke and mirrors, the best thing we can possibly provide is cultivation of that trait. Thank you so much for your continued support through YouTube and our Patreon account where patrons contribute directly to the production of new episodes. Like this video, share your favorite, subscribe, and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns. He's actually right there. True. Which is actually true. True. And that's true. We don't know for sure. Right. Okay. True. And all this is true, by the way.